Hello? Cool. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I think we will get started now. So if you don't know why you're here or what this is, this is Satellite, which is a monitoring talk. If you're here for something else, cool, you can stick around. Otherwise, see you later. All right, I'm Sunil Abraham. I work at Two Sigma Investments, which is a quantitative hedge fund in New York City. The core of Two Sigma's business is to process as much data as we can in order to make the most informed investment decisions possible on behalf of our clients. So distributed compute is critical to the success of our business, and today Mesos it forms uh, the backbone of distributed compute at Two Sigma. My talk today will be about Satellite, a monitoring application um, and also host inventory management application that we wrote out of our need in deploying and managing uh, to thousands of non-commodity Mesos hosts in multiple data centers. Mesos provides inventory management through the whitelist file. Uh, the whitelist file is a plain text file with a list of host names. At a given point in time, if you're a host and your host name is on the whitelist, you're eligible to receive new tasks. Otherwise, you're not. It's pretty simple. However, today, Mesos does not provide any way to manipulate the whitelist file. So if you want to do inventory management, especially inventory management for real and in real time, you do need some process to generate the whitelist file for you. And this is where Satellite comes in uh, for us at Two Sigma, and maybe for you too, especially if you're not doing something like this uh, right now. The code for Satellite is open source. You can check it out today. It's on GitHub. It's Apache 2.0. Go to github.com slash Two Sigma slash Satellite. If you do try it out, let us know what you think. We'd love to hear. Uh, how, how you found it. Right, so Satellite does three things. Uh, one, it monitors your cluster. Two, it alerts. And three, it administers. And by administer, I mean it auto-administers and it provides some manual administration. What do those three things mean? Well, let's start with the easy stuff first. First, there's monitoring. Monitoring is providing a global view of the cluster. Um, aggregating all the information from the slave host and providing it to you in really however you want to package it. Mesos provides some way to monitor the cluster today through its REST API, uh, both on the slave nodes, so you can get individual metrics at the slave level, and then at the master level on the, on the master host, so you have some aggregate statistics uh, at the mass throughout the cluster. There are two problems with this. Firstly, uh, it's a REST API, so you need some process pulling this to aggregate this information for you. And secondly, if you want metrics that Mesos currently doesn't expose, you're out of luck, uh, because that's all you get. For us, Satellite is able to provide fine-grained uh, information at the host level, uh, whatever you want, uh, just whatever you're able to expose through the shell. And we're able to aggregate this. Uh, through a stream processor. So for example, uh, if I want to know in real time what percent of the cluster had high swap utilization, this is a question I can ask today with satellite that I'm not able to answer in, uh, in Mesos. Or what is the median CPU load across the cluster? Alerting is also straightforward. Alerting means communicating status changes uh, from within the cluster to the outside. So if the cluster is on fire, please tell me, because I want to know about that. A great example for this is how do I send you a pager duty alert at 4 AM when you know, the cluster has gone down, has gone down to 70%, because 30% of hosts have disappeared. This is something I want to know. Administration is a little more nuanced and a little more interesting. Uh, it's the ability to control when a host will receive new tasks. When we say auto-administrate, we mean programmatically be able to specify this, to be able to give a set of rules about when a host should be online, should be put on the whitelist, or offline, uh, on the whitelist, not able to receive new tasks. The way Satellite is able to offer this to you is it provides two primitives in its rules engine, uh, an on-host and off-host. On-host takes hosts uh, and puts them on the whitelist. Off-host takes hosts and takes them off. The motivation, the idea here is that if all your hosts are healthy, satellite should make sure that they're all on the whitelist, all able to receive new tasks. 
But if a host becomes unhealthy, if it becomes a black hole where all your tasks go to die, well then I want to take it offline. I want to put it off the whitelist. And if your host self-heals later, as is often the case, turn it on. And all of this should happen without your intervention, just being able to specify rules once and then you know, go to sleep at night. However, if you're thinking about this uh, for more than five minutes, you'll realize that automation without any kind of override is a disaster that's bound to happen in the next fortnight. So when we initially wrote satellites, we didn't have a way to uh, provide these manual overrides. And we found that there were times we wanted to turn hosts off, but we couldn't because satellite thought that the hosts were healthy. So every time we tried to turn it off, satellite would turn it back on. So today, satellite provide, does provide manual overrides. It provides a REST API where you can set per host on or off. And if you've set an override, satellite will respect this over the rules engine that you've uh, already deployed. So for example, if you want to set, do some maintenance work on a set of hosts, you can just uh, turn a bunch of hosts off, wait for them to drain out, and then do your work. Another example could be that, uh, say there's a deployment that you depend on and the deployment has gone bad, uh, and you realize this, even though satellite thinks that the host is healthy, you can say, actually, I know the host is unhealthy, please turn it off, and I'll deal with this in my own time. Right, so now we kind of know what satellite is supposed to do for you. Let's talk about how it does it. So let's go over a high level view of the satellite architecture. In regular Mesos, or just in Mesos, there's, uh, there are two types of hosts. There are slave hosts and there are master hosts. And on these hosts, there reside the Mesos processes, respectively the Mesos slave process on the slave host and the Mesos master process on the, Mesos, uh, on the master host. In satellite, this architecture is uh, respected and reflected we have a satellite slave process existing on each uh, slave host, coexisting beside each MESO slave process, and a satellite master process existing on each master host, coexisting beside each master, uh, MESOS master process. And then the slaves communicate with the masters over TCP, sending them status updates. So let's dig into each of these. Uh, and work our way from the middle out. So let's focus first on the events, these status updates that the slaves are sending to the masters. Every status update is, in fact, a Remon event. If you're not familiar with Remon, don't worry about it. We'll talk about this later. Every Remon event for us is just a key value map. There's nothing crazy here. A Remind event is identified primarily by three things. The host, which is where this event came from. The service, which is a string that identifies what kind of event this is. And then time, a notion of how long this event is valid for. There are other conventional fields, like uh, state and metric, that are optional. And we'll talk about those later. So now that we know what a Remon event is, what these status updates are, let's ask ourselves, how does the slave produce them? A satellite slave takes a user-specified list of tests. Each test is just a shell command that runs periodically and then produces a list of Remon events, which are then uh, sent to the master. So let's look at these tests. Here's an example of a test. Uh, this is a uh, closure, but don't worry. I'll walk through it step by step. It's not that scary. Here's a command I want to run. It's uh, my dash test, which is in my user bin. And I want to run it every 60 seconds. And if, the, if my test returns exit code 0, this is how I know that everything is OK for that host for this test. So I'll stash in the state that things are OK. Otherwise, I'll say things are critical. And I'll put the metric in the metric field, the exit code. And the event is valid for 300 seconds, so five minutes. And I'll identify the test with the string my dash tests. So this is how I know later 
what this event actually means. A better test, however, would be to change the metric field to reflect something else, and then change the service to reflect what the metric is capturing. So now let's say that we say we set the metric to be one on a pass and zero on a fail. So when the exit code returns zero, return one, otherwise return zero. And then uh, the service is now my test pass count. The idea here is that in our central stream processor, we have a lot of primitives to operate on the metric field, specifically to aggregate across the metric field. So here, now, we're able to like, very easily, later on, if we wanted to, ask a question without doing very much work, such as, how many hosts do we have that are currently passing my dash test? Whereas, you could also do this in the central processor if you didn't frame it like this, but it would be a little more work. And we'll see what that means a little later. So now that we've produced these events, we're going to send each of these events to all the masters. And that's it. That's what the satellite slave does. It's super simple. So let's focus on the satellite master. What does the satellite master do with these events? How does it process it? And how, do the, how does the satellite master actually interact with Mesos? Satellites monitoring and alerting capabilities come from Riemann. We embed Riemann within the same JVM as satellites. Riemann is a stream processor written by Kyle Kingsbury, also known as Afer on GitHub and Twitter. Uh, he's well known for his Call Me Maybe series where he stress tests a lot of distributed systems, so you may know him from that. Uh, I know him as the reason there's a lot of bondage in my Twitter feed. Um, yeah, that's kind of how it goes. You can't take one or the other with uh, AFER. Uh, so Riemann offers a lot of primitives and functions for monitoring and alerting. And what you don't already have within Riemann, you can write yourself, because every Riemann rule specification is, in fact, a closure program, uh, which is uh, just Java, really. So whenever, uh, sorry, whatever you want, you can make yourself. You have this Turing-complete expressive language to do whatever it is you want to do. These are the reasons we actually chose Riemann and we embedded it within satellites. It was really easy to extend. It suits our data model of uh, monitoring and alerting, and we had a ton of experience with it already. It also explains a bit about why we chose Clojure to do the satellite master project, especially um, because Riemann itself is written in Clojure. So let's actually look at what Riemann can provide you. Like, what, how does a rule uh, look in Riemann? So we're going to look at uh, first something really, really easy. So we want to turn on hosts, or we want to turn off hosts that have high swap utilization. And everything in all these examples, there will be a few examples just to show you how powerful Riemann is. Uh, all the examples, they're all stock Riemann except for on host and off host. Those are primitives that satellite provides to you. It actually injects those within Riemann. But everything else, all the documentation you find online, all the tutorials, they're all still good. Right. So we want to do the super simple thing. We want to say, like, when there's not enough swap, just turn the host off. So we have this stream of events from all our slaves. And we want to say, listen, I only care about the swap events for this rule. So I want to filter from that stream. That's what the where clause does. It's, uh, it's a clause that says, you know, where the service matches Mesos slave swap, keep going. So now we have this filtered stream of just swap events. And from that filtered stream, I now just care about uh, events that, ha that uh, cross this threshold, this arbitrary threshold that I've chosen of 90% swap utilization. So if the swap utilization is below 90%, I think the host is totally fine, so I, I want to make sure that the host is on. Otherwise, I want to turn the host off. Pretty straightforward. And on and off hosts are idempotent, so um, as the stream keeps flowing, it sh yeah, on on is the same as on, off off is the same as off. So this will give us this kind of behavior, which is uh, 
this idea of having, uh, you should take care of the case of sustained changes in state, which is, I think, something that we want. But one problem is that this also uh, takes, doesn't take care of the case of flapping transient states. So if, some, if the threshold is bouncing uh, above 90% and below 90%, we'll be flipping the switch on and off repeatedly. And we probably don't want that. Um, and if you don't want that, it's actually really easy uh, to get this case. Uh, this is actually what we probably want, to only switch the state when there's uh, a consistent state change and the thresh uh, across the threshold. So this is easy to express in Riemann. This is a little more complicated, but uh, we'll go through it step by step. So we're first filtering on these swap events again. Pretty easy. And we pass this stream to SMAP. So SMAP is a map over a stream. So if you're familiar with map, what map typically does is it takes a list, it takes a function, it applies that function to every element of the list, and it returns you the, the output, so the function applied to each element of that list. So SMAP is the same, but it, it applies it to streams. So we have this stream, remember the swap stream, and we're going to apply a function on each of these events where we set the state field to depend on the metric. So now we're going to say, if it's below 90%, set the state to be OK. Otherwise, set it to be critical. So we now have this stream of events of swap events where the state field has been set. But now we're going to do a fork by host, where we're going to say, for each host, create a new stream. And for each, for each of these streams, where we have a stream is just now just a stream of, for a given host, these are the stream of events for swap that have the state set. Every 300 seconds, I want to make sure that the state field is stable across that. So has the state always been OK over the 300 second window? Or has it always been critical? If not, just drop the event. I don't care about it anymore. But if it has, if it has been consistent over this 300 second window, I want to see what that state was. And if the state was OK, then I want to turn the host on. Otherwise, I'll turn the host off. And that will give us this behavior. So the, over this 300, we require over the 300 second window that the threshold was either above 90% or below 90% to make any kind of state change. And it gives us this. So when there's a sustained uh, state, that is the only time we flip. So I talked earlier about medians, about maybe talking about median CPU load or median swap utilization. But what does it mean to say, I want median swap utilization on the cluster? The problem is that even when we filter for these swap events, events can and do arrive to the central processor at different times. This is just something you can't resolve. So how do we even define which events we want to perform median on? What does it mean to perform median here? A really easy thing, a sensible thing to do, would be to take a rolling window and only remember the most recent event for a given host. This is also something that's very, very easy to do in Riemann, and you can do in a few lines of code, in three lines of code. So first we do our typical filter, where we only care about the swap events. And we set our window to be 120 seconds here. And we apply this function called coalesce to the stream of swap events. What coalesce does is it remembers the most recent event for a given host pair. Sorry, a given host service pair. Here, that just means remember the most uh, recent swap event for a given host, because we've already filtered on swap. Um, so now we have the most recent, uh, the most recent swap event for a given host. And then coalesce will emit every 120 seconds that set or list of events. And that gets sent to the median function, which will then just get printed out to 
wherever you've directed your, your log. You may have gotten really excited by this and you want to do this for every single metric for all your services. Um, and this is easy as well. You do it in three lines of code. You change one line of code. Instead of filtering, now you're just saying, I want to do it for every service. By every service, coalesce all the events, and print out the, the median of the metric. I also promised you the ability to be alerted at 4 a.m. So let's, let's, uh, let's do that as well. Let's define a pager duty object. And let's set a, a rule where we are going to filter based on Mesos proportional available hosts. So this is uh, an event that Satellite provides. This isn't something you have to create yourself. Since Satellite is keeping track of the inventory, it's able to inject these events into the stream. So Satellite is injecting this event of proportional available hosts. And it will flip on if the available host is less than 70% of what you think it should be, trigger a pager duty alert, otherwise resolve it. And again, trigger and resolve are both idempotent, so trigger, trigger creates the same alert that, um, well, is the same alert. So you don't have to worry about this stream of events applying the same function over and over. So every master should see every message. And to make sure that we generally only have one action, we have the leader be the stream processor. Any state changes, which is a host being on or off and the reasons for that decision, those are written to Zookeeper by the leader. And they're read by the followers. The reason we do this is that in the event of a Mesos failover, the satellite masters should be uh, relatively consistent and up to date. The way the Mesos, or sorry, the way the satellite masters communicate with Mesos masters is through the whitelist file. It periodically flushes the inventory to uh, disk. It just overwrites the whitelist file, and the Mesos master is always reading that. And that's it. That is what satellite will do for you today, and how it does it. There's a lot of other interesting stuff about how it manages state within the system. Um, if you're interested, we can talk about that. But future areas that we'd like to continue to work on are recipes, UI, and hot reload of configs. So what do I mean by recipes? I mean just more code as an operator that you can just have immediately available to you that you don't have to write yourself. For the satellite slaves, uh, that those are just tests. We, we provided some tests that we find useful, like number of uh, processes and uninterruptable, uninterruptable sleep, like weird things like that. Um, for the Mesos master, it could be uh, just more remod rules that are geared towards Mesos inventory management. We have a web UI. We're able to see what all the hosts uh, look like, whether they're on or off, and the reasons for that, and to be able to just push a button to enable it or disable it. But it looks not that great because we're not front end engineers, so we'd like to make that look a little nicer before we show it to you. But that's something we'd. Uh, like to release as well. And then also, we'd like to be able to do hot reload of configs because there's no reason why you should require a hard restart like we currently require if you want to uh, send a new config to us. Um, if you could just catch a sig hop and then hot reload the config, then you would never drop events, which should be preferable. Satellite's been in production at Two Sigma, like I said at the beginning of the talk. Uh, across multiple data centers, managing thousands of hosts. And I want to tell you a story about what happened when we didn't have satellite and when I deployed it. So when I first deployed satellite I, to, in production to one of our clusters, I immediately took down over 20% of the cluster. At first, I thought I had done something wrong with the deployment, but it turns out the deployment was fine and satellite was doing exactly what we wanted it to do. It was turning all these hosts off uh, because all these tests were failing. What was happening was there were a lot of uh, jobs that were stuck and had been thrown into swap. 
So uh, they were shut down because we said turn the host off if any test is failing. And I'll get back to that in a second. But what, the reason this is bad is that these jobs had been stuck for weeks and close to a month when they should have just been running for hours. So these were resources that were not available to anyone else. And for us, where we're always close to 100% utilized, this is particularly bad. If you don't have a similar system to satellite today, you are like we were, which is a dog in a room that's on fire. Um, and you're not like this because you're crazy. You're like this because you actually don't see the fire that's around you. A common pattern that we employ is to make sure that uh, we turn off any host in which any test is consistently failing. And the reason we do this is that it encourages a kind of fast failure that doesn't extinguish any fires, but really forces us to face issues when it actually is an issue, when things are really kind of off. And that's it. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you to Two Sigma for sponsoring the work and open sourcing it. There were a lot of people involved in that, so uh, too many to list, really. To David Greenberg for a lot of the initial architecture uh, discussions that really make up most of what satellite is today. To Kyle uh, Afer for making Remont and providing amazing support in the IRC channel. Uh, so if you are thinking of using a monitoring system, I highly recommend using Remont just because of the support. It is unbelievable. You get nine to five support Pacific Standard Time for free in free node Remont. It's, it's really crazy. And to Leif Walsh for um, a lot of help with uh, the talk itself. And to Legion for suffering many rehearsals with me. Again, the code's online. You can check it out, github.com, two sigma satellite. Uh, tell us if it sucks. That's fine. Uh, or tell us if it's awesome, whatever you think. Thank you very much. Okay. You want to ask one? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, uh, we have big boxes and we, we run this closure program. So, it actually is probably, it's bigger than it needs to be, definitely. Um, the reason we write it, we did it is because we didn't want very much. Like, we just, what we, what we want to send to the central processor isn't very complicated. We want to run a bash script periodically, and we want to send remote events. That's it. That's all we want to do. So this is like simple enough that we were happy to just write this ourselves. Uh, the reason, I, it would probably be a bit too memory intensive for commodity hosts, but there's no reason why this couldn't be rewritten in a different client, because all this is doing is producing Remont events, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, it would make total sense to me to have the same thing but not use our satellite slaves to use something else, um, sending these Remont events. Yeah. Yeah, whatever we're specifying, yeah, absolutely, sure. This was just like, the reason we did this is because it was easy and we were able to do it in 30 minutes and we didn't have to read any other documentation. Like, like that's the short answer. Uh, and are you running, uh, so basically like all my slaves are sending to the US to each and every master on Bishop's slave? All yes, so yes. And so there, I, there are a lot of questions you can ask about that. So what's your question about that? So, but then, uh, so basically my event goes to three machines, for example, if I, if I have a yep. Sorry? I don't have a question about human trash. So basically, if you are basically throwing your master cluster, so you will be sending the events yep. to all of them. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, is there any way to just like have uh, send only one master and then have bookkeeper uh, choose to say where the leader is? Yeah. yeah. OK, so the question is, do, do we send the event to all the masters, and is there a way to send it to one master? Um, so yeah, right now, there's. Uh, so yes, the answer is yes, that's currently what happens. We send it to all of our masters. Uh, there are reasons, there are reasons why I can see why you would keep it like this. Um, like if you, 
if we had the stream processor not be limited to just the leader, but um, you have the option in your Riemann config, like if we provided a leader predicate where you could check, is this Riemann, is, am I currently the leader? If so, do this processing. Like, if we continually send the events to everyone, you know, you have the option as the operator to decide, like, oh, do I want to do something with this event or not? Like, you could be the one that makes the decision, do I want to be a stream processor or not? Do I want to act on it? Maybe you do want to act on it multiple times. Um, right now, there isn't a way to uh, just put, like, put a kind of, put the string in, in Zookeeper because the architecture we had was just, you know, here are the, we have a static list of masters, so that was easy to deploy. Um, but that, I mean, that makes sense to me, like if you had more than three masters. But for, for our use case, this really suits. Um, but there's no reason why not to. Oh yeah, so I guess the other thing is that it's not high traffic. Uh, we don't come anywhere near to saturating uh, the, the network interface, so it's not a big deal for us. Because we don't send a ton of metrics. Yeah. Well, uh, it's hard for me to give you a benchmark. All I know is I benchmarked the, the network traffic, and it wasn't any, I just remember it wasn't anywhere near close to saturating it. So I, it, didn't, it didn't even blip when I turned the stuff on and when I looked at it a few weeks later. So it wasn't something I was worried about. Um, like, we don't send super fine-grained information. We, we tend to send these events every, like, five minutes. Uh, so it's not a ton of events, and it's something that both the network and Remont can definitely handle. Yeah, so th th that's what I was getting at, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think right now that actually doesn't happen, but that's the reason we sent it to, to all the masters. I think it's actually not, uh, it's like just immediately dropping the events. I don't think, I think the Riemann process, I, it's, I can't remember exactly, but I don't think it does that, but that's, that was the original motivation, is that you have the option then, and then the index, and then there's a failover, and then there's as, there's as few dropped events as possible. But um, yeah, that, is, that was actually the motivation for sending them to all of them. Yes. Uh, we didn't, but uh, so like, Sensu is an agent running on each of the slaves, just basically sending events, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, where it pulls. Yeah, so I guess for us, we really, I mean, we were, we really liked, like we had a lot of experience with Riemann. We were already using Riemann in our production environment. So we, and it was easy to extend. So I guess we chose Riemann because it did everything we wanted it to do. Um, yeah, I guess that was the reason why we chose Riemann, as opposed to even considering something like Sensu. No, yeah, so good question. Uh, sorry, I haven't been repeating any of the questions. Uh, question is, does satellite kill any running tasks or preve just prevent new tasks from being launched to that host? It's the latter. So all satellite does is manage which hosts are on the whitelist, and all the whitelist does is uh, specify where am I allowed to send new tasks. So yes, that's all it does. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I mean, I've thought about that before, but I sort of, I kind of wonder, I think that should be more the framework's decision 
not satellites, because if you have a bunch of frameworks running, how do you know that, how do you know that these tasks are, you know, bad in a way? Like, in a way, like, I, I, I sort of feel like this is more the, the framework's responsibility than, than satellite's responsibility. Um, and I think I'm being told to wrap up, so uh, thank you all for coming. If you want to hang out and chat, I can. Cool. Thanks.